Um, so, Tim, thank you for joining us. We'll talk first a, a little bit about some of the challenges, the sort of big picture stories around the aviation industry at the moment, the competitive environment as well, and then some of the, the, the digital um, strategy that Dan was referencing. In terms of that big picture then, travel demands in the Gulf region, the weaker oil price threatened that for a while. That was evident back in March, wasn't it, in some numbers. How are things doing at the moment on that front, in that region for you? Well, the, the uh, region is actually coming through a very difficult period, I have to admit. Uh, we have geopolitical tensions that you ought to be aware of. Yes, we've had a slowing of the economy simply because the, uh, the governments there who, who are fueling the, the private sector in the, in the uh, GCC countries have slowed in their expenditures simply because the oil price has come down. That has changed the mix of the business so that we don't have so many... Um, corporate travellers, as we might have done in the past, paying the good money that they used to, but nevertheless, um, the other segments of demand, putting aside the issues that we had with the American markets in the early part of the year, have come back quite strongly, particularly as we've just completed the, the summer months now, and, and a lot of people did travel, mainly to Europe and Asia out of the region, so now we're just settling down to see what's going to happen in the next six months or so. So settling down and things have come back, putting aside the US travel disruption, but tell me about that US travel disruption, where we're at now, because the initial um, storm passed to, to some extent, but how's mm. that been reflected in, in the way the business is performing? It's US? actually outperformed where I thought it would be. Um, we did strip out capacity from the US, as you probably know. We didn't actually cancel points. We just brought down the capacity of production either through gauge change or frequency. Um, and that uh, adapted what we needed to do, given the demand fall. Since we've uh, seen the reinstatement of this and things have moved on, the, the, the demand has come back fairly strongly. I haven't yet reinstated the capacity that I took away in the early part of the year, but the residual capacity is now running at over 90%. So actually, it's doing some very good bottom line stuff for us. And in the fullness of time, probably during the course of next year, if things stabilise, we've had hurricanes oh, mm. going on yes. at the moment. Yes. We had Houston last week. As we, as we work through um, what is a very difficult market in the US for reasons other than aviation, uh, nevertheless, demand for travel is still fairly strong. And I'm hoping that in the next six to nine months that we will restore our capacity to what it was at least mm. uh, prior to the uh, laptop ban and all the other bits and pieces are going on Do in the Do you US. see those security concerns coming back? Is that really what motivated this laptop ban or is there something else that threatens your business model from, from, from the, uh, the White House or from, uh, well, from I, beyond in Washington? Know, who can actually say what's likely to happen in the White House these days? It changes from day to day. Um, I, I will say this, that, that in the early days, and when you roll back the clock to the middle of last year and what was going to happen, what wasn't going to happen, and then it happened in November of last year, and there was a huge degree of volatility. It, it's still working its way through the planet, but in terms of how it affected demand for travel and people actually traveling into the US, there was shock, there was withdrawal, there was um, a, a, a real concern and anxiety. I think they've got through this and they are getting used to the changing environment. Even though it may be a changing one, they're getting used to change, and that is not deterring the demand for travel. That's where I remain confident that we will, people will get used to it, overcome it, and move on. Mm. Um, the United States remains a hugely potent market for us, and it always will be. And some of your rivals in the United States, of course, have an ongoing campaign. They want the US government to take action against airlines that come from the Gulf and the, the, what they describe as unfair competition, and you see it very differently, I know. Is, is that, are you hearing that, that, is that going to gain momentum? Are they getting, getting are they being listened to in Washington? Well, where have they got to? They started this two and a half years ago. At that time, we, we were about 30% of what we are today. Um, so it's actually got them nowhere, and uh, however hard they try, uh, they continue to, it seems to fall on deaf ears. It may seem that they are being listened to, but... Proof of the pudding is actually what is happening, and actually not a lot is happening. Um, and uh, Because I think the multiple stakeholders in the US economy value the value that we bring to the economy, not just to the stakeholders that are in our supply chain, but also the consumers that come in and spend a lot of money over there. Uh, we, we, we do a very good job in terms of serving points that none of the American carriers will serve, can serve, without resorting to their uh, alliance partner friends who invariably don't do a good job because they're capacity constrained themselves. So in the end, um, what we have done, we've measured this in many, many ways. Our, our, our contribution to the, to the US economy is enormous, not just through 
that, but also through the acquisition of the uh, assets that they produced, they produce aircraft and uh, engine. Yes, you talked about the, the aircraft you buy and the number of uh, people you employ. Back in the Gulf region, another challenge that the Gulf region has faced is, is a, a lack of unity within the GCC, and that obviously has weighed on Qatar Airways. Has that been something that you've seen in your numbers, people moving to other airlines such as yours, or just avoiding Gulf carriers as a whole, how has that played out for the aviation sector? Well, I, I, you know, there were, there were initial traumas, I have to be quite honest, but, you know, <laughs> things have settled down now. There is a, a, a degree of equilibrium. Um, I'm not going to comment on the, the politics of it, but I'm saying there has been a redistribution of the way people travel around the region, and, uh, and yes, we can say we might have benefited from it, I don't know, time will tell. In terms of people traveling to and through the region, if you take the United Kingdom market this summer, it's been the most prolific, most robust uh, two or three months we've ever had on, in, in the history of our, our, our presence in the, US, UK, in the UK market. So people are not being deterred by what is happening down there. The notion that Dubai has a lot to offer itself, but is also a massive transfer hub to all the Asian points that you know about that we serve, uh, remains a popular option and a, and a good value for money proposition. Mm. Another big uh, challenge your business faces is that what you've described as a gathering storm from the low-cost carriers as they increasingly move in to long haul. Where, where, where are we on the sort of evolution of that challenge? We seem to be, it's, it's growing very quickly, isn't mm. it? But we're quite near the beginning of what it could be. Yes, I, I've, I've often banged at the table about the uh, long haul low cost. We've seen what happened in uh, short haul low cost. That was an explosive effect, almost nuclear on our industry, uh, for the best. Uh, they've done wonders for the consumers. They've, they've done great things for the, uh, the industry as, as it, uh, per se. In long haul low cost, it was only a question of time. The uh, economics are slightly different, probably more difficult. But nevertheless, um, it is clear. And as we move into the digital technologies that are going to wrap uh, uh, the uh, the wrap round us in the industry over the next few years, um, it is clear that the the place for the long haul low cost is definitely there. Uh, there are a lot of impediments to that, not the least of which is aero politics, because you've got a lot of company, countries that are predetermined in their thinking and don't want people like that. For instance, you know, we only fly three times a week to Canada because they're worried about us. Now, um, um, uh, uh, Canada is a huge market, and it has multiple cities, and lots of those people originate in the Middle East or the markets we serve beyond Dubai. But what do we they can't worry get about? There. Well, you better ask them. They seem to think that we are a, a terrible threat, and uh, we're going to wreck the aviation scene in in the um, in Canada for our friends, our competitors over there. Now then. If you've got a problem with that, then what's it going to look like when long-haul, low-cost low operators start hitting Vancouver and Calgary and Toronto and Ottawa and places like that if they can get in? Very difficult. However, it is a fact of life, and I think it's a great development in the industry that the long-haul, low-cost, it gives, uh, it, not problems, it gives us riddles, issues that we have to solve with regard to how we go about the execution of our business model it's clearly not the way of the past. We have to think again what we're going to do. But are they going to happen? Yes, they are. Are they going to bring value to the business? Yes, they will. Are they going to bring good choice and have great value proposition to the consumers? Yes, and more will enter yeah. the aviation scene. And will they be welcomed in Middle Eastern airports? Will they be that competition right They're on already your there. doorstep? They're already there. In the we, long haul space. We've had yeah. uh, Tony Fernandez uh, with HRX a long time ago into Abu Dhabi. Mm. We've got Norwegian coming in into uh, Dubai, and frankly, as you know, the government of Dubai welcomes everybody and anybody, and they, if they bring value, and so we, will, we can uh, expect more of those, um, and uh, we'll just have to, to yeah. as, a, as a competitor, deal with it. What's the, what's the primary strategy for dealing with that then? Is it to strip out the frills and make people pay incrementally for all of those frills, or is it to invest more in the frills? Well, I think one of the, the biggest single issues that a long haul, low cost model is going to face is that the likes of Emirates are going to be re-examining the way they go about their presentation of their products and delivery of their products. And it is clear that with the digital revolution going on at the moment, we are quite, we are far more capable in stripping out and reconstructing in this tech environment to offer what people want in the long haul low cost, almost at competitive affairs, and build the proposition through ancillaries and reconstructing so that you actually get where you think you need to be through uh, 
income streams other than in the seat inventory itself. Now, what we will do in Emirates, we're going to do that. We're on that. And this is why we're here. You know, we're spending a lot of time and money and getting that right. So in the end, I'm hoping that Emirates will be able to match the long haul low cost in the, in the base price that they uh, offer in certain segments of the inventory that we have on our aeroplanes. Don't forget, we have 97 380s, and we have plenty of space that we can play around with our inventory and compartmentalize if we need to, creating three or four economy classes, if you like, on the main deck. So I'm looking to adapt what we do, knowing that this is going to come, yes. and that we've got to recognize and importantly deal with them. And, and uh, you know, we used to have this thing called interline. Well, interline from a full service to a low cost is difficult, but nevertheless, there is clear evidence of cross flow. And yeah. we must adapt for that. And I was going to ask you about that, about partnerships and about how you either work with or uh, with either with low cost or with other partners to try and take on the challenge of, of low cost. Partnerships incredibly important to mm. your business and increasingly so perhaps with the low cost challenge. And I think that has always been a, a difficulty. As I said, full service, low cost, the business models contra-rotate. Now you've got to somehow bring those back into alignment where you don't interfere or disrupt say, the, lo the low-cost model of, of a, a long-haul low-cost operator, because the essence of what they do is, is a cheapness of low-cost operation, obviously, in every facet of what they do. So, again, going back to what we're here to talk about in the next few days, how do the technological advances we're making in the tech side of things allow business models to speak in a seamless, seamless back-of-house manner without disrupting the requirements of the Business, business models. Where it becomes more difficult is not so much that, but in the manifestation, the physical presentation of the product, airports. So if you want to go from a long haul low cost to us, you have a point to point fare, your bag turns up, and now it's got to be transferred. People yeah. have got to be transferred. That involves customs, it involves multiple stakeholders who have got to be there to do it. Can it be done in the future? Tech will let you do that. If the stakeholders, other than the two airlines involved, are ready to do it with you. If they're not, then you've got a problem. You have to invest in a lot of technology each time you do a partnership, <coughs> I suppose, as well, to make everybody's technology speak to each other. Um, I, I mean, most recently, Fly Dubai, there's, there's a, there's, you're waiting to, 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 to start that, aren't you? What, what is that going to look like? How is that going to change what you're doing at the moment? Well, I, I think um, what we know will happen is that with the, the, the confluence of these two carriers, uh, you, you will have a, a network of pushing 250, 300 destinations at all levels, from, from major hubs down to third and forward level operations. Uh, their model is essentially low cost, but it's becoming a little bit more hybrid because they have got business class, they have got frequent flyer programs, they have got lounges, etc. Flat beds now coming in business as well. So the assimilation of the two is far easier than it would be for somebody who's, you know, uh, a, a 29 inch. Uh, 12 abreast, yeah. long or low cost. And putting the two together, um, I, I believe, and obviously the ownership, the, the Dubai government believes, the value that we will extract by com merging the two is far greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and I think there is real, real uh, value in doing that. So we're working very hard to try and strip out what we can't do together, go for the ones that we can do, and start the cross flows. And it's working. We already have about 17,000 passengers a week moving between the mm. two carriers, we used to have about 500. So uh, the, way you well. the way you describe uh, competing with the low-cost airlines, the way you unbundle what's included in the price maybe, and you allow passengers to build up their own product, mm. technology is going to have to be a part of that. How is uh, it, it, it is the bedrock yeah. on which it sits, let's make no mistake. If you want to roll back 15 years, you couldn't do any of that. You could try, mm. but you had all sorts of things. Now, what's happening, which is the beauty of all of this, is that we can do all of that and a lot more. Um, so I, I'm very enthusiastic about how this, these developments, the revolution that is going on in, in almost the, the front of house, yes, customer-facing systems, the way you go about assembling your resource and how you do back-of-house systems are going to be completely transformed by this, and then we'll be able to do all sorts of things with passengers other than just deconstruct and reconstruct in an yeah. unbundled, bundled environment. I'll be able to do a lot more because I'll know a lot more about you and what you like and what you don't like, yeah. 
and bring in dynamic pricing, different, all sorts of things. Like that. With that in mind, you recently appointed, of course, the uh, Christoph Muller as, uh, to, to, to run a lot of the digital stuff for you, digital yeah. and innovation officer. Um, I've read all sorts of uh, experimental things that are going on, a crew being given eyewear to <coughs> augment their reality, augment yeah. the reality that the things they know about me, what wine I might like, for example. Um, which of these things are you most excited about? Which is going to make a... Because they're, they're, they're nice, fun to talk about, but which is going to make the biggest well, difference to your business? It's, it's a, an interesting one. What I said to the, to the conference last year, there are uh, many, many businesses are going for the customer-facing innovation, okay, because that seems to be low-hanging fruit, possibly going to, in their view, deliver the value a lot quicker. What I asked Christoph to do in the teams was to do a bit of that, of course, and you've talked about augmented reality spectacles, and these kind of things are, are very much in their infancy, but boy, are they going to come? Yes, they're going to come as part of that mantra of, of trying to understand what people do and know about them before, probably know more about them than they know about themselves. At the same time, deconstructing the, the company systems and um, reconstructing them in the digital environment. That means you've got to speak to your IT legacy systems because IT no longer remains as it could have been. Essentially, it's legacy. The digital platforms and the processes on which the, 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 uh, the, the, the sorry, the platforms in which these new processes will sit are fundamentally different to what you do today. Um, so back of house, to enable us to do a better job in the front-facing consumer activities, of which we know there are many going on at the moment. We've got lots of software houses and startups, etc., all beavering away. What I wanted to do was take a hard look at how we actually build and run our processes, and then to deliver through, through uh, data analytics, once we've got the new processes in place, extracting data from those processes to see how we can better construct the kind of product that we want to do, as well as taking a lot from outside as well. I make no mistake, we're not going to be reinventing the wheel here. We're going to listen and see with partners, of which there are quite a few out there, some of which who are competitive to us, you know, Facebook, Google, who are all trying to commoditize us, okay, because they're essentially an online platform. They have no physicality mm. in terms of great big 380s. But they have data. But they have data. And I want to try to work with them, and I, you know, and see how. But the important thing was deconstruct the processes because we found there was a real labyrinth there. But if you really want to go into the future, and you can talk digital, you can act digital, but you're not actually hitting the spot. You've got to look at how your DNA, how the whole thing works, which is why Christoph has come in. We've had um, up to 500 people from the business working all hours, doing that job. Mm. And now they're ready to go into the next phase. So are other airlines talking too much about the, the things that the customer sees and not enough about blockchain and the building blocks behind, behind well, real revolution? Blockchain is a, um, uh, one of those facets, one of those tools that we will use with regard to how we go about some of these applications, whether it be a new PSS system, whether we, it's the ERP systems that we need to put in place. But, and, of course, the industry needs to look at blockchain very seriously. Like the BSP, the art of clearing houses, all these things are becoming to look a little bit flaky and a bit, little bit Jurassic as we move into this technological revolution. And uh, we, we, what I'm trying to position the company to do is, and from the top, you know, fuddy-duddy like me, um, <laughs> trying to get everybody, 82,000 people in the whole group, moved onto the acceptance that there has a new platform, has to be a new platform, that there has to be a new way of doing things, because otherwise we're never going to get to that kind of personalization, pricing dynamic, um, competitor uh, uh, action that we, we, yeah. we so aspire to. And if data is the new oil, which I know has been talked about, are you, uh, uh, do you have access to all the data you're going to require? Are you going to run up against privacy issues, these relationships with these companies that you want to of build? Course. It's going to be costly as well. Of course, and and you know we, we we extract data through our genome activity. We might have about 150 things on a group. Uh, Alibaba's got 3,000. You know, so we know we have a long way to go. Yes, there are data pri privacy uh, uh, elements. There are cyber security uh, issues as well, which are which are now becoming so vital to what we do. Um, but nevertheless, as we work down that path and. As, as, as of the uh, beginning of next month, the on online accelerator teams, etc., is now kick in and start doing, actually uh, bringing the processes that have now been designed, redesigned, take them and put the software, the coding in there, test them, fail them, 
bring them back, incubate them, and pl put them back into the business. I'm looking to see, probably in the middle of next year, a, sway, a suite of products coming through that the digital teams will now bring to the business and improve what we do. It sounds like you're going to continue to need deep pockets for innovation to, to fund all of this. You still have deep pockets for innovation at Emirates. You, if it, look, we, I don't know many airlines have got really deep pockets, <laughs> but our business needs to have this. It is the one big chance we've got to get our business um, into something that is really, I'm not just talking about Emirates, I'm talking about the business, one that is fully engaged with the way the 21st century is moving at such a pace. If we do not do this, then, and you decide you're not going to deep into your shallow pockets, mm. you will perish. Mm. You will not be there because people have moved around you and gone on. The consumers are expecting all sorts of things, and we know that, we don't have to talk about it, how our lives are changed as a result of it. Our business has to move, and it has to move at the pace that others are doing at the moment. What I'm finding that a lot of people are paying lip service to it, but actually not doing it. And uh, that's a worry. That's their problem, not ours. I'm trying to get our business sorted on that. Okay. So Tim Clark, President of Emirates, thank you very much. Thank you.